live it is tuesday august 4th 2020 502 p.m we are late today and it is not youtube's fault it's not the fault of any technical difficulty it's just that we were shooting the shit and having a good time and we didn't go live on time so you can blame this one on us if you want um uh uh yeah so uh, <laughs> i have spent the day making obscene gestures to the ds dhs surveillance drones that are following me everywhere convinced correctly that they have discovered my secret identity as the uh in fact the head of antifa uh the whole lawfare thing being a national security law nerd was all an elaborate ruse to keep DHS from figuring out the truth that those Portland protests, I'm directing them all from right here using coded messages on in lieu of fun. Um, so far, this is the, the storm. worst call to the Manchurian candidate I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, keep going. The, um, the storm has passed Washington. The skies are blue. The, uh, there, there's a cool, uh, uh, a kind of weird, uh, post storm radiance in the air. Have, has it made it to new England yet? It has indeed. And we can tell that because my dog is freaking out. Um, Mimi gets Excellent. very, very worried when it starts to get like, you know, there's changes in barometric pressure. So she was hiding under the bed just five minutes ago. How, how is it on Cape Cod, Kate? We're, it's supposed to go west of us, so we're getting a bunch of rain, and I think a bad piece of it broke off, and we're going to get a thunderstorm that passes right over us, but mostly the main thing is away from us. The trees, though, even though we have blue skies, like, the wind is insane. Like, there's just, like, everything is, like, all over the place, so. You guys have a tornado warning, too, right, tonight? Because yeah, we do, we have, starting at nine, yeah. We have tornadoes, and we, have, yeah, so the tornado warning, and, yeah, so things are... Yeah, not as bad as I think that they would be if I was in Boston, but um, well, I think we're, in, we're close to Boston, but my understanding is like the, what we're really fortunate is that we're not in Western Mass. That's I think where it's gonna get bear the brunt of it. Really? So that turned, huh? And when it is going up, that's that's gonna be- Well, basically like if it goes straight up from New York, that's what it hits, so yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, we got a lot of rain here and uh, then it stopped, which is normally the case with rain. Um, we are not allowed to have fun anymore. <laughs> and we are not allowed to have Kashmir Hill here today because uh, the storm disrupted her power and she uh, couldn't uh, join us. But in lieu of fun and in lieu of Kashmir Hill, we have Dan Dresner, who uh, seems like the perfect person to have today because it was like last night, the president um, and, and to be fair, I didn't watch the interview because I have very few, few religious principles, but one is I do not listen to his voice when I don't have to. <laughs> um, and so I just haven't listened to it. I have a but I've that's read gonna all make me feel better to listen to him being actively mocked like while talking. No, to I don't I just it. don't listen to his voice if I don't have to. Um, and so um uh, but I know all the Twitter about what he was doing, and it seemed like he was on a one-man, one-day campaign to sell your book, Dan. So <laughs> he, he is the, the author of The Toddler-in-Chief. He was the guest on episode 24 of In Lieu of Fun. 107 days later, and I know it is 107 days because we have not missed a goddamn day of In Lieu of Fun since it started. Dan Dresner is back to talk about the Toddler in Chief and his incredible interview with uh, Mr. Swan of Axios. Uh, what do you make of it, Mr. Dresner? Professor Dresner, sorry. I'm not saying it's a coincidence. You call me it, Professor Ben. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. I also usually build you we up that way. We have the most favorite Nathan principle in terms of who call, gets called Professor. But um, 
As it turns out, the you, press is, it had announced, this, this, I'm not kidding, that um, if you go to Amazon or, or the University of Chicago site, the online, the ebook version of this is 99 cents right now. Wow. So it really does seem <laughs> like this has been like fortuitously timed to uh, promote the book. But I, 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 as much as you might not like Trump's voice, uh, Ben, I would strongly encourage you to actually watch the whole interview. Um, because no, no, no. It, you, you don't understand. Religious principles are religious principles. I like, <laughs> you know, you know, the Orthodox Jew who really likes bacon cheeseburgers. You know, it doesn't matter if you say, I strongly urge you, this is a really good bacon cheeseburger. I have a religious principle. I don't listen to his voice if I don't have to. It's not negotiable. Okay. All I'm saying I will is- I on you to, to tell me what I need to know. The problem with this is, is that essentially there isn't a moment in this interview where you're not cringing. Like if there was an aerobic, you know, caloric intake, like value that you could burn for just constant cringing, you know, like a, a 30 minute cringe burn, as it were, I, I really do think that that America could lose w the weight that we've all put on clearly by working from home, you know, by uh, by just watching this, you know, on a, and, and just burning off those calories by just going like this constantly. Um, because really what, it, it's hard to describe how many appalling things he says. Um, and there are times where Trump says things where, you know, as someone who does listen to him, there are times where, you know, I, I can hear him mangle his words, but I understand what he's trying to say. And maybe what he's trying to say is not as odious and offensive is what he's actually saying. In the case of this interview, though, there was never any of those moments. It was all awful. Um, Jonathan Chait uh, in New York wrote a great sort of summary of like the, I think the top nine worst things he said. Um, but I think the, the one that, that stood out to me, which I wrote for the Post today, is basically Trump claiming that the US has done everything it can possibly do to get the coronavirus under control. In which case, uh, you know, we're screwed, like just royally screwed. But what what's more problematic is that obviously we haven't done everything. And yet he thinks that somehow we have. And so it's just, uh, you know, it, it was almost like he was waving the white flag of surrender that we're basically screwed in this sort of purgatory of constant infection until the, the vaccine comes. All right. So. Trump is ridiculous all the time, and yet this interview seems to have struck people differently, including you. So my question is, you know, sort of Manish Tanaha Laila Hazemi Kol Halilot, you know, like like what makes this different from? Did your internet uh, just go all... out again? You were just like gar like garbled. No, I was speaking <laughs> Aramaic. <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to leave now. <laughs> you know, I get to yeah, exactly. Your um, Keep going. I mean, like, you know, w w what was different about this interview from all the other Trump interviews that are ridiculous? Well, fellow Semite, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I, I would say a couple of things. That's yo, fellow Semite. Yo, fellow, yo. What is Semite? I, I will tell. I will give you the answer right now. Um, I, I think. I think a couple of things are, are are different. The first is is that in contrast to let's say, and and by the way, like this is not a knock on Chris Wallace, but if you go to the Fox News interview, for example, that he did, the Fox News Sunday interview, that was clearly edited, right? They they you know they clipped certain parts of of Trump the conversation to sort of move it along. Um, it seemed less edited. This that this was more a sort of Trump stream of consciousness kind of rambling, and that made it in some ways worse. Um, there were two other elements that I think also, well, three other elements that, that made it worse for Trump. Uh, the first is, and I can't say this enough, the production values were extremely high. You know, this, this was, you know, just two people sitting for an interview. You might think at most they're going to have two cameras. They must have had at least three or four there. There and were a so lot. Yeah, there were a lot of cameras. And so as a result, there were shot, they, they constantly move from shot to shot. And let's face it, we're visually stimulated. That is something that captures your attention in a way that just a sort of two shot interview 
would not necessarily do. So it, the 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 production values were were very high, which might sound like it's odd, but I really do think that that actually made people pay more attention. Um, a second thing is that Jonathan Swan, as an interviewer, was at least as good as Chris Wallace, and in some ways better because he just wouldn't let go on some of the things that Trump would say. Like when Trump was talking about how mail-in voting was this new thing, Swan immediately shoots back, started in the Civil War, what are you talking about? Or when um, Trump tried to claim that, you know, we test too much and that's the problem, and Swan says, what are you talking about? Like, where are you getting this from? And he says, books and manuals. And and Swan says, literally, like, what books? What manuals? Where where are you getting this from? And so just wouldn't, wouldn't let up. And that, that's related to the third thing, which was my favorite thing about this, because, I, I am in genuine awe of the media folk who can go on camera and actually have a poker face, you know, manage to, to, you know, just sort of have resting, you know, anchor face where they're not ruffled necessarily by the absurdity of what people are t telling them about. Now, there are ways in which I think that's, that's not always that healthy, but there are times where in fact, that kind of professionalism is genuinely laudable. In Swan's case, he doesn't do that. When Trump says something that's absurd, Swan's face goes, like, you know, it's just all these, like, you know, like, I mean, you're seeing these memes on Twitter now, of, like, you know, all these different sort of, you know, Swan faces where he's just like, basically variations of what the fuck are you trying to say right now? Um, and just, uh, you know, and, and that can be very powerful if, Trump is expecting you to to take you take him seriously, and when he does, you know, when someone does that to you, I think it actually, you know, sometimes causes you to flounder even more. And so I think there were times where Trump kept sort of digging, as it were, and and you know, kept digging the hole even deeper. Kate, Kate, I'm, I'm no, not here. You're muted, Kate. There we go. There we Sorry. go. Yeah. We do this all the time. The tech. But that was worth it. Your, your, your reaction being unmuted. <laughs> that face was priceless. There was a Jonathan Swan like moment. That was a Jonathan Swan like reaction. Exactly. But there is like, but so I watched only a couple of clips. And one of the clips that I watched that was most striking was the one where Trump is just shuffling through yeah. these pages and these charts. And, right. and, and Jonathan Swan is saying to him, listen, like, you, and he's like, we are the lowest, which is to me, and Trump is saying, we are the lowest, which is to mean to say that we are the highest, we are the best, <laughs> yeah. and we are the best. He's like, but you're, we're not. And I'm not talking about deaths per cases. I'm talking about deaths per capita. Per capita. Right. And, and like, and basically like Trump, I think this is, okay, so it's obviously a great question. It is obviously a very smart question. I don't know how great any president would have done at doing this. But the, but I think to your point about the kind of like the film, the filmography and the shots that they're able to get, yeah. it just shows him fluffing these papers. It just yeah. shows him fluffing these, like Trump fluffing these papers. And he don't even think that his like response is so terrible. He stays on message. He keeps trying to like kind of say this, even though it is a good question, and he's obviously flubbing it and not addressing it. But like the most amazing part is just that like someone is just talking back to him, and just like you're wrong. This is a good question. No, I'm not asking the wrong question. This is a good question. Here are some right. facts. That's not correct. And then Trump has to say, oh, well, that was the those were the numbers I was given yesterday, or something like that. And like. There is just this this um, advance, advance, advance that is so much not seen in these like pat high level interviews anymore, where you're just like Barbara Waltersing it and like which type of fucking tree are you? And it's just like it's really nice to see this kind of moment of like, okay, like we're not gonna let you get, we're not, we're not just gonna pose the question and let it sit that you haven't answered it. We're gonna ask it eight more times. And we're going to like make you give us like, yeah, show it to me on the chart. Show me the chart that you're referencing. Show it to me like you crazy person. Like, and it was just kind of great. It was all great. I mean, none of this is going to change the minds of Trump voters in any, in any appreciable way, but it just feels like a part of the general disintegration of the presidency 
like historically that we need to have on record. Um, and to that, it's also just this moment of schadenfreude, I think for all of us a little bit. So, all right, so I'd say a couple things to this. The first is that you, you're right. This is not gonna persuade anyone that was not persuadable. I mean, so the way in which this matters in terms of the campaign, I suppose, is well, two ways. The first is, I, I, I'm willing to predict that some of this is going to show up in a Biden attack ad at some point because it's really easy to do. Um, I'm sure the Lincoln Project is already, you know, cut an well, ad. Or yeah, something. I was going to say a Lincoln Project ad yeah. by the end of the hour. But the point is, it, it's a, it's another news cycle lost. So in other words, you know, we're now like less than 100 days to the campaign. Every day that goes by where Trump can't somehow redirect the narrative somewhere else is a day that he's losing. So this is a day that he's losing again. Um, the second thing is, is that, and this is consistent with the sort of toddler argument I would make, I think, I, I don't know if he did stick to the talking points very well. This is clearly someone who, yeah, I mean, I'm sure Kayleigh McEnany tried to brief him, but the very fact that in the end of that back and forth with Swan, he winds up just giving Swan the pages. That's actually the sign that he's lost. Because in the, in the clip, he let, you know, he's trying to defend, he's trying to defend, and really, at the end, he's helpless. He just says, here, look at the pages. This is what I'm talking about. It takes Swan all of two seconds to figure out what the, the, the Trump talking point is and why it doesn't hold up, saying, no, I want to talk about death per capita. And then Trump never has a response to that. So, um, so in some ways, he's not like a normal president in this sense, because I think you know, Obama or Bush or Clinton or Romney or what have you, if they were in the same situation, they would have taken the interview seriously. They would have done the prep work to like be able to anticipate pushback or at least be able to stick to a line of argument, you know, longer than than 30 seconds. But and this is the last point. I, I do want to stress this. You're right that there's a lot of people saying, oh, finally, someone pushed back on Trump. Fi you know, finally, someone gave him a tough interview. And we saw this, I think, also, you know, pop up during the Chris Wallace interview as well, where, again, Wallace, you know, held his feet to the fire on numerous instances. But I think the odd thing about that is I, I, I certainly agree and I like seeing those interviews where people actually like, you know, call him on his bullshit for lack of a better way of putting it. But it's also worth realizing that Trump has gotten into trouble in the most cream puff interviews imaginable. Um, think about Trump's interview with Hannity, where all Hannity asked him was what is your plan for a second term? If there was ever a softball question that you could come up with, that was it. And Trump whips on it. He, he, he can't come up with anything. Or think about the follow-up to the Wallace interview where, I can't remember the name of the doctor, but th this is where the, um, you know, the, the person, woman, man, uh, uh, camera TV thing comes from, where he's talking to some Fox and Friends doctor who like praises his leadership or so forth. But all you have to do is watch that minute of him saying that to realize that it's, it's not good. Um, so I, I agree with you that I, you always want to see interviewers push back on him, particularly when he's just lying or bullshitting or what have you. But I think at this point, Trump gets into trouble in any interview. I don't know if there's an interview context at this point where he's actually going to be able to have a conversation where he doesn't come off sounding uninformed and, and frankly, not with it. So... Julia Yaffe this morning tweeted what I thought was a very interesting point, which is that Jonathan Swan is getting a lot of credit and rightly so for the toughness of this interview, but she wonders whether the president would tolerate that degree of pushback from say a Michelle Cinder or uh, a woman in general or a person of color, and that she actually wonders whether uh, Jonathan Swan has leeway to be as aggressive as he is because he's, you know, an Australian accented white guy. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about that. If, if Yamish had, who is a, you know, very aggressive questioner and uh, appropriately so, had done the same thing? Would Trump have told her she's being nasty and stomped out of the room? I think the, so there's a couple ways to get at this. I think, first of all, I think Julia's general point is well taken, which is there's a selection effect at work here, right? Trump is never going to sit down with you, Michelle Cinder. Trump is never gonna sit down with um, I, the CBS reporter, uh, um, the White House reporter for CBS, uh, her, whose name is escaping, but she's equally good 
you know, in the, in the White House press court, I apologize for forgetting her name. He's never going to sit down to those interviews um, because he, you know, he just won't. Now, you might say that's bigotry. It might be because he views them as nasty and unfair to him. What You might view him as scared. There's any one of a number of things. He's not going to do that. Um, it did make me think, has he sat down with any interviewer who's not a white guy? And I think the answer is yes, because I remembered immediately. Maria, Maria, Bar uh, Maria Bartiromo, who's like, yeah. you know, the biggest. And, and also, um, I think her or name is Har Harris Faulkner. Um, although even Harris Faulkner, Fox, you know, Fox News, mm -hmm. that was the moment where he talked about like, what had Lincoln done and Harris Faulkner had to say, well, he freed the slaves. <laughs> you know, remember that? I mean, you know, that was. So, so well, and he sat, he sat down with Diamond and Sill. Come on, yeah, right, okay. But the the point being that I think absolutely, I think Julia's point is well taken that um, that Trump is not going to sit down with women of color who are going to ask him, who are That's going right. to interrogate him. He's just not going to do that. I don't think, by the way, that that means therefore Swan should, out of principle, decline the interview or not do it. Um, that's not, in some ways, that's unfair to both the American public and to some extent to Squan. I mean, he's, he's, there's no de denying that he's benefiting from, uh, Trump's, you know, bigotry for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, but I'll leave it this way. I think if you, Michelle Cinder, the interesting counterfactual is if you, Michelle Cinder had actually done the interview, if Trump had sat down with her, how would it have played out? And I do think you're right that he would have become even more combative. Um, and maybe would have walked off the set um, much more quickly. Um, I mean, I, you know, he does that even in the White House press, you know, uh, in, in the White House press room. And it's not just, you know, when you Michelle Cinder asks him questions, it's when Caitlin Collins asks him a question too. So I also think it's, right. it's gender much more than, than anything else. So, but I fully acknowledge Julia's point that, that Swan and Chris Wallace before him are getting credit because they're asking, you know, tough questions, which any reporter would have done. But Trump will sit down with those guys where he won't do it with Yamiche. There was this one moment to follow up on that, Ben, in the interview that I, like specifically the clip I referenced before with all of the charts and everything about COVID and the death rate, um, in which like he's pushing him and pushing him and you're probably at minute four in the video, I think. It was like a five minute video that was posted. You're at minute four and he says, well, Jonathan, that's just not true. But like in this kind of like very conversational, very like in using his name, his first name, using his like using that. And just it was it was a very strange like it just kind of struck me as very personal, um, like way for an interviewee to like respond to an interviewer. Um, like we had an agreement, Jonathan, like this was like, but this <laughs> like, like that's kind of like the sense that I kind of read it. And I'm curious if anyone else thought that, that was like, saw that clip and thought that that was strange or slightly gendered or slightly just kind of like insidery and weird in that context, or if I'm just over reading it, but you don't typically, when you're talking one-on-one -on -one with each other, there's not like a need to say the person's name, unless you're trying there unless there is this kind of like moment of psychological kind of like people like to hear their own name does that make sense like there's like it's um it's like a te technique so i'm curious about that hi no Dan, that's normal ben just oh okay okay people we've been hijacked. just brought in our next question people hi, will baby. start showing up we're gonna ask them to that. talk oh, no, this is Daniel. He came to ask you a question. Chill out, oh, man. Okay. <laughs> Am I? Can I go? Yes, go ahead. Dan. No, 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 da no, 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 no. Wait, wait, because 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 Kate Kate just posed a question. So let let Dresner ask answer Kate's question, and then we'll go to you. Okay. Um, I let me put it this way. I think the, I think that it, it's a psychological ploy by Trump, but not necessarily the one. I don't know if it's the one that you're suggesting, which is that it somehow softens the interviewer. I think it's a way in which Trump makes it seem like he's still in control. Um, that, you know, he'll say Jonathan or what, you know, Chris or what have you in a way of making it seem like I'm letting you ask these questions. I'm, yeah. you know, that's, that's what I think is going on. But, but that, if I understood that, it's not him trying to befriend the interviewer. It's him trying to, it's always with Trump. A, a, it's like a power to thing. Power. Yeah, exactly. Totally. 
Daniel, the floor is yours. Uh, good I guess I have Two questions. One, what do you think of Trump exposing kind of the anti-intellectualism in American political life? And do you think it's an underrated force? And second, what are your thoughts on Democrats removing the filibuster in light of, say, the increase in uh, the presidential powers and when we get, you know, possibly a crazy person in the presidency, what happens if we get that in a Senate majority and there's no filibuster? Um, okay, so first on the, the anti-intellectual nature of Trump, I mean, this is where Trump is way more a symptom than a cause um, of, of what's going on. Indeed, you know, I wrote a book back in 2017 called The Ideas Industry about changes in the marketplace of ideas. And I was writing that book um, during the 2016 campaign. And, you know, I'd written the, the, the final draft and, and I knew I was going to get a, 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 another crack at it in the copy at, at its stage after the election. But I wrote it on the premise that Clinton was going to win, because at that point it did seem like that was the more likely outcome. And so then Trump won, and I was, I'm getting the, the, the manuscript back, and I thought, oh boy, I'm gonna have to do serious revisions, aren't I? And then I went through the introduction, and I realized, no, this is easy. All I have to do is cut this like page and a half, and like actually my original thesis works better with Trump winning, which was utterly terrifying. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the idea that, that Trump is unique in this sense, I think is 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 largely incorrect. Um, he, you know, we've had a long tradition of of intellectual bashing. Um, you know, in, in this country for quite some time. You know, go back to Richard Hofstetter's anti intellectualism in American life. Um, and and I would say, to be fair, it's waxed and waned. It's not like it's just like the slow descent. Um, there have been periods where uh, intellectuals have been highly valued, and then there have been periods where they've been discredited. Um, and right now we're in a period, we're in an odd period right now with the pandemic, but like until Trump's election, um, intellectuals had had a, a rough go of it. I think in fairness, for reasons that Chris Hayes talked about in his book, Twilight of the Elites, where there were a number of scandals that intellectuals had been involved with where expertise and authority was, was no longer necessarily trusted. So the interesting question is whether the pandemic and seeing what happens when you elect uh, someone like Donald Trump to be the president will cause a reversal of trend. Um, and that's an interesting question. And I don't, you know, we're come back in four years and we'll find out there or for that matter, four months on the filibuster and ending the filibuster. Um, my take on this is that I see the arguments in favor. Uh, but what it means is essentially that, if you have the same party in charge of both the presidency and the Senate, there is an awful lot that you can do to the federal government in terms of both purging on the one hand and appointments on the other um, to where we stop really looking like a presidential system and we look much more like a parliamentary system of government. Um, and that means that unfortunately you're going to see dramatic swings in public policy. Because if you, th you know, for people who think that, oh, this is the Democrats moment, they're gonna take the Senate, they're gonna take the White House, they'll control the House, game over. It's not game over, it's, it's you know, game over for 2020, but I can easily spin a scenario where by 2024, all three of those branches are suddenly held controlled by Republicans. And so the question you always wanna ask is, do you want, is what sort of system of government do you wanna design whereby if you were in the minority, you are able to at least have some influence. Um, but the problem, of course- Dan, can I just follow up on that for a second? Sure. C because I, I am bewildered by the Democrats' enthusiasm for getting rid of the filibuster. The, the Republicans have a structural advantage in the Senate, um, which is owing to the fact that there are these big empty uh, uh, states, each of which get, get two senators. Um, and those are very conservative states on average. Um, and that a relatively small percentage of the population controls 52 votes in the Senate. And uh, those tend to skew conservative. The result being, if you look since 1980, the Senate has been in Republican hands more often than it has been in Democratic hands. 
So if, mm -hmm. if you're a Democrat, I understand people are enthusiastic about, okay, we have a chance to have the presidency, have both houses of Congress and get a lot of progressive stuff done. But it seems to me what you're actually doing is you're creating rules that make it easy for, easier for Mitch McConnell to do what he wants most of the time. So what am I missing or are the Democrats deluding themselves here? You might be missing two things, I guess. Thing one is, is that I do feel like Democrats are hoping that 2021 to 2022 is a replay of what happened, let's say, in 2009, 2010, um, where they did control all three branches of government. There was a brief moment where they had a, a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate, but even that moment required, you know, Obama to have to play nice with Joe Lieberman. Um, and I think what some Democrats want, and particularly progressive Democrats, I suspect, want, is for if you get rid of the filibuster, it doesn't just mean that 50 plus one gets you what you want. It also means perhaps that these people aren't going to, you know, that progressives aren't going to be fit, feel that they're being held hostage by, let's say, the Joe Mansions of the world, who are not necessarily going to go along with everything. Um, and as a result, they could then potentially get a burst of, of legislation passed. I think the second thing that they're thinking and this is where I'm honestly, I'm unfamiliar with how this process works, but I think they're assuming that if they get rid of the filibuster, what the Senate can also do is approve two new states, namely D.C. and Puerto Rico, with the idea that that in turn would presumably introduce the possibility of four new Democratic senators, which would reduce the possibility of Republicans getting the majority. Although this is where I do want to go on a slight rant, because I actually think this is this might be the most short-sighted move by Democrats, um, which is to say, first of all, Puerto Rico has had Republican politicians. In fact, I think the governor is still a Republican there. Um, so the idea that that's two, you know, uh, Democratic seats that that, that are uh, in the bag is absurd. But the bigger problem is, is D.C., which is I understand why they think that D.C. will actually stay Democratic for quite some time, but I don't think they're in. Look at this way. If I was a really wealthy Republican and D.C. was made a state, that is one of those moments where I would literally pay a billion dollars just to gentrify D.C. with the idea that you would then have nothing but country club Republicans, you know, living there rather than, you know, African-Americans and uh, professionals. And I, I this is one of those things where I don't think anyone has looked past the next couple of years in terms of making D.C. a state, because that would strike me as the easiest state in the world to flip. Oh, man. I don't know. I've lived in D.C. I've lived in D.C. for 30 years, uh, 35 years. Uh, there are some heavy cultural lifts you'd have to get through to do that. But um, but your point is well taken. The population is small. It's a small population. It's geographically concentrated. And in a private real estate market, it wouldn't be that hard to buy, frankly, literally buy out a lot of people. It's so interesting because you're making my point. I've like just went on a rant a couple of days ago about this, about how like this is like a perfect example, a prime example. This is not usually the one I use involving mm -hmm. like the possibility of like DC statehood, but a prime example of how like how land use and property law is like fundamentally like about power. And like, right. if it's not directly about political power, like in this context, although this would be a great example, like it's about right. it in other more subtle types of contexts, then I think that it's a really good point. We have a question that I have an, um, an addendum for. I'm just going to read it um, okay. from Kevin Donahue. And he asks, how does this interview affect your expectations for Trump in the debates? And my addendum to that question is, why do you think we still need to have debates? Do you think the debates are actually like, uh, like are, there's never a winner, there's never a loser. Every side just gets confirmed in their beliefs. What is the point of debates? Um, all right, so I'll answer the second question first. Yeah, we need debates. Um, even to the extent to which you might think they're scripted and or we don't learn a lot, I think it's worth remembering two important things. The first is, is that most Americans are not like you or me, okay? The overwhelming majority of Americans have not seen a single second of the Jonathan Swan interview of Donald Trump, okay? Most Americans are checked out on this stuff. Um, there's a concept in political science we, we call rational ignorance, which means that basically most voters, 
you know, don't pay that much attention to politics most of the time because they have very little incentive to do so because it usually doesn't affect their day-to-day -day lives. Now, an election is an exception. And debates are one of those few moments where people who are certainly going to vote, but otherwise acquiring almost no information whatsoever about what's going on, might actually pay attention. So if there's if there's a way in which, you know, like the, the cliche, you know, life is not like Twitter or life is certainly not like politics Twitter is true, it's that we all think, oh, we've seen this a million times before. We've seen all these canned statements and so on and so forth. There are Americans who have not. And they need to actually see the canned statements. They need to see the, you know, sorts of things. Um, and so that's why, you know, and, and so debate serves as a focal point where we can all, you know, not just, uh, you know, political wonks, but ordinary Americans pay attention at the same time, decide these things. The second reason I think, and this, by the way, comes up again in terms of why Trump stumbled so badly, is that presidents, once they get elected, if they so choose, can seclude themselves rather easily from tough questioning from reporters, from tough questioning from political opponents. One of the few exceptions of that is debates. Debates is one, you know, is a rare moment where in fact a sitting president has to deal with someone else. Um, who is it not it's necessarily the sitting president? And sometimes they stumble. Even the best politicians do this. You know, Barack Obama, you know, Mitt Romney craned Barack Obama in the first debate that they had. Walter Mondale, clobbered Ronald yeah, Reagan. Creamed Reagan in the first, in the debate. first debate. You know, People which led to that. questions about Reagan's age, which led to the- I should the go back and watch that. I watched yeah. that, like, I watched that. Yeah, I'm not gonna mention when I watched it because it'll make you all feel old. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I should go back and watch it. You watched that. it when you were six, I understand. <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, five years, whatever. But um, the point being that, that you, Presidents in particular, but but any major party nominee needs to you know needs to to have that check. We need to make sure that they can actually handle this sort of thing. Um, and in that sense, three debates is entirely appropriate. Now, as to how the debates are going to go, this is what this is another thing where I legitimately do not understand the GOP's thinking on this, and Trump's in particular, because the way one of their lines of attack has been the sort of sleepy Joe Biden thing of like. Biden can't string two sentences together. He's incoherent. You know, he's not he's not playing with a full deck. He's senile. All of those things. Now, let me be the first to say that that Joe Biden has probably lost a few miles off his fastball, you know, relative to let's say a decade ago or two decades ago. Um, that said, I, I think there are two things that are worth pointing out. Well, three things that are worth pointing out. The first is, and maybe I'm alone on this. I think Joe Biden has actually gotten much stronger as the campaign has gone on. And in fact, by the way, this goes back to the debates thing. In the summer of 2019, in like those first couple debates, Biden was bad. He was legitimately bad. Um, but with each passing debate, as the number of people on the stage, you know, shrank, he got better. Um, and indeed, in the final one-on-one -on -one debate with Bernie Sanders, a lot of the Bernie bros were all like, oh, this is finally the moment when Biden, you know, caves. Biden was pretty good in that debate which is not surprising because Biden is a career politician who's had a lot of debates, you know, including against Sarah Palin and against Paul Ryan. Um, you know, he's acquitted himself reasonably well in these things, uh, which is why I think the sort of claim that he's, you know, he's, he's, you know, that he's seen or so on and so forth. All Biden has to be is perfectly adequate in these debates and he'll do fine. He's going to exceed expectations. I think George Conway's word for perfectly adequate was a rotten tuna fish sandwich. Uh, yeah. was like, he was like, would you elect, who would you vote for in the, the election? <laughs> Trump or a rotten tuna fish sandwich? It was a Twitter poll. And he got like 600,000 votes for a rotten tuna fish sandwich. The way, the way I would put it is, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's the Simpsons. It's like, you know, all Biden has to be is an inanimate carbon rod. And there will be a ticker tape parade for him. Yes, you know? exactly. um, so, but it, but in Rodney Trump. But, but, so, and, and but wait a minute. Trump. If you're good, if you're one of Biden's people, though, yeah, you do have to worry about a Biden stream of consciousness monologue that he does seem to have an inability to turn off. Yeah. Uh, that really uh, becomes. Um, you're not worried about that at all. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I, I mean, I've, it, if I were Ron Klain or you know 
the yeah. campaign staff of that, I would be concerned about that possibility. Now, and it seems to me there's a very simple strategic solution to that problem, which is to uh, uh, prep the candidate as much as possible right. to let Trump ramble. And yes. basically you have this, like it's a completely asymmetric debate in which Biden takes the view, uh, if Trump cuts me off and wants to go on a rant, I just let him. Yes. If he wants to exceed his time, I'm not going to fight him over time. I'm going to articulate my themes that are in my time, that are I'm going to restore honor and decency and, and to the presidency. I'm going to uh, make, uh, I, I'm going to not be a racist. And I'm going to uh, Biden, do something. Fuck up. Yes. Do something about COVID nineteen, and thereby let the economy restore. Um, and I'm going to have confidence in certain baseline American values like normalcy, decency, and I'm going to, you know, yeah. be a normal president. And I'm going to articulate that briefly and and candidly whenever I get the chance. And any time he wants to talk and go off on some rant uh, that will offend somebody, I'm just going to let him do it. But I, so I would say two things. The first is, I'm not sure why you don't think Biden's going to. Biden will totally do that. Um, you know, he, he's been prepped. This, this this is one of the weirder aspects of the pandemic, by the way, which is, you know, everyone is concerned. Biden is 77. There are legitimate concerns, I think, to be raised about age. And yet, oddly, because of the nature of this campaign, Biden might wind up being the most rested presidential candidate. <laughs> after he gets, no, I'm not kidding here. I no, mean, I know you're not, and you're quite right. Think about yeah, I think it's a great point. Think about the ordinary, like if we, if, if on Earth two without the pandemic, Biden would be what, like you know, barnstorming across the country, you know, every day. He wouldn't be getting much sleep. He'd be glad handing. He's good at that stuff, by the way. Have you ever met Joe Biden? He's like fantastic at that sort of stuff. Um, but yes, he would. I he would be exhausted. Now he's mostly staying home. He's getting rest. He's doing the stuff on Zoom. He's like all of us, but you know, he'll be thoroughly rested and ready. The second thing is, and this is the important point, is that even if Biden goes off on one of those tangents, even if Biden is goaded by Trump once to like, you know, talk about corn pop or whatever, you know, like lash out, one Biden screw up, the ratio will be one Biden screw up to five Trump screw up. Yeah. Because I guarantee you, Trump is going to, the idea that, that Trump is somehow going to eat Biden alive, I find laughable because Biden is a horrible, I'm sorry, Trump is a horrible debater. He's he's never been a good debater. Um, Clinton cleaned his clock three times in a row. It didn't necessarily have the the, the final effect that you were worried about. But, well, go ahead, Kate. You're, you're, no, you're, that's you're, exactly my point, which is that like, everyone who's going to vote for Joe Biden is going to vote for Joe Biden. Like, yeah. even if he's a senile, rotten tuna fish sandwich, right. there is nothing he can say or do that is going to keep people from voting for him, frankly. Uh, you know, and that's not true that you'll get people to literally go out to the polls to vote for, like, a really great candidate. Like, if you'd had Kamala Harris or, like, someone that was, like, or, like, Elizabeth Warren, people would have felt, like, but but we picked the safe candidate. We've got this like person that is like inoffen like that is like inoffensive, a white male, like you know, kind of establishment right. older guy. And it's it's very comfortable to people. They'll go out to the polls to vote for him and feel fine about that. And the my point is, I guess, was like asking about the point of the debates is like I don't think really any votes are gonna change in any columns or people. I agree with you that most people don't follow the news, aren't gonna watch the Axios debate, aren't gonna do all of these things. I completely get that. Um, I kind of just don't think that the debates themselves are gonna matter that much. Like if that ends up being like, that ends up being like, basically I don't see any minds being switched. I agree with you. He, Trump is terrible in debates. He was yeah. completely walloped by Hillary. It made no difference. It was all for all of us that were watching to feel okay. good. So so there's two ways to think about this. The first is, is that I would dispute the point that the debates didn't matter in 2016. They did matter. If you looked at the poll, I mean, if you, you looked at the polling averages, you know, 
Trump had actually caught up to Clinton. Trump and Clinton were tied the night of that first debate, because I remember that first debate night being freaked out, thinking I can't believe Trump is actually like even with Clinton. And then after those first two debates in particular, Clinton winds up building a, a you know like a, a seven or eight point lead. Now that lead disappears once Comey reopens the investigation and we all know how this plays out. Um, but the idea that the debates don't matter, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree, because bear in mind, most of these polls that we've seen so far, there's about eight to 10 percent percentage points of undecided voters. That is, by the way, fewer than was the case in 2016, which is another strong sign for Biden. The fact that Biden is polling on average like at 50 percent or above, I think, on the 538 uh, measure is different from Clinton. Clinton had a lead but the lead was smaller and also it was more like in the 40s. So, but that said, there's still eight to 10% of the electorate that is undecided. My hunch is, is that if the, when the, that a lot of them will decide during the debates, they're probably gonna break 60, 40 Biden because that's what all the polling I've seen suggests in terms of those truly undecided voters. So I agree with you in some ways that the, the, the debates probably won't have that much of an impact, but there is always the possibility that they do. There's the possibility that Biden really comes across as, as, you know, a phasic or what have you. There's also the possibility, by the way, that, that you know, Trump manages to, I, I'll put, I'll lay a marker right now. There is, I think, at least a one in four chance that Trump utters a racial slur during the debate. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's really? a larger yeah. chance. Well, not, not a, I, I mean, not in the literal sense that Dan stated it, but I think there is a much greater chance that Trump does a mic drop moment yeah. of embarrassment than that Biden does. Biden yes. is a is a relatively disciplined politician who uh, has an aphasic quality, which, by the way, may have to do with the fact that you know he had a cerebral hemorrhage at one point. Like he actually has existed, you know, people always attribute it to um, uh, to his, uh, since that Atlantic article, to his stuttering history. But this is a guy who had a stroke for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of possible explanations for it. Back when Ruth Bader Ginsburg, by the way, I don't think it's a few miles off his fastball from uh, so when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was nominated, Biden, uh, there's a, a new Republic article entitled Blah, Blah, Blah by Joe Biden, which is a transcript. <laughs> it's three columns of full page of a single question that Joe Biden asks nominee Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, during her Supreme Court confirmation hearing. And it's this deranged stream of consciousness piece of craziness uh, that the punchline is at the end, the nominee says, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, I what didn't understand question? that. Can, can yeah. you ask, can you repeat the question? And like Joe Biden has always been like this and he is, uh, you know, I relentless. He's relentlessly inarticulate. And I, I think it's a it's a it's something that people have long priced into who he is. I actually don't think it's age related. I think it's like he's always been like this. And you know, Barack Obama famously said to him um, when he picked him as his nominee as his his running mate, I, "I I value your experience, Joe, but can you give it to me a little bit more briefly?" <laughs> um, you know, it, it's like it's a it's like a big part of who he is. I will say uh, that your point that he is completely different in person uh, on a one on one basis is absolutely right. He is warm and he does have this incredible ability to make you feel like like he is He's engaging. A good yeah. Engaging deeply with you because yeah. you're important. And I, I think he makes a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. The way I would put it is that Don, Joe Biden genuinely likes being a politician, which yes. is something that Trump clearly does not. But like he likes interacting with people, which is why, you know, weirdly, the pandemic might not be good for him either. I, I would say I, I'm not going to deny that Biden has been inarticulate at, at many times. 
Biden also has a pretty decent wit. I mean, anyone who can, you know, describe Rudy Giuliani as a noun, a verb in 9-11, you know, deserves some, he, that was, he, Biden came up with that. Um, so that's not insignificant in, in my eye. In, in At least we think that Biden came up with it. It might have been yeah, something so, one of his staffers came up with. Maybe. It's a great line. It's a great <laughs> line, though, right? It's yeah. so good. You know, I mean, it's like, so, and, and you know, I've, I've, I've had to testify in front of Biden, actually. And so there's no denying that he has those moments where he does just so go off on the stream of consciousness. On the other hand, I don't think it's all that common. I mean, like, you know, he, it's most of the time he, you know, he's, as I said, I think he's a, a reasonably normal politician. And also this might be where it, it's a minority view, in my opinion. I think he's gotten better as the campaign has gone on. I agree I think with that. A, he's like a retiring, I think it was like a, an athlete who had retired, announced that he was going to have one last season in baseball. You see him initially in spring training and he looks awful. His timing is off. He can't hit the fastball and so on and so forth. And now we're in August and, you know, he's he's getting his timing back and, and so, so forth. I actually think it's something totally different from that. Oh, I agree okay. with the point, but I have a completely different explanation for it. All right, let me hear it. So, well... The initial phase of the campaign was him on a stage with, you know, a dozen or more people. Right. Men, Marianne, well, most, many, of whom, many of whom are attacking him, mm -hmm. some of whom are wackadoodle, um, and a bunch of whom are completely beneath his weight class as politicians. Um, and it's actually a little bit insulting to put a former vice president up on the stage with Marianne Williamson. Um, I don't mean that, I, I, you know, but his, yeah, 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 like, and he's looking left and looking right and people are, uh, and, you know, Kamala Harris is calling him a racist or saying that she had to, you know, that busing means something very different to her. Like these, this is a, a very different situation than he normally deals with. And he's not good at that situation. But then right. as, as the campaign evolves, it becomes his job is to sit there and remind people of the dignity of the office, hmm. talk about policy, and to shut up and let Trump bury himself. And he's really good at that because yeah. he's actually a pretty good politician. And so well, I think so I think he's like yeah. like the the situation, and by the way, the debate, the reason he did well in the one-on-one -on -one debate with Bernie Sanders is that debating the left on a one-on-one -on -one basis, why you shouldn't be more radical than Joe Biden, he's pretty good at that. It's it's the hundred arrows coming from a from a million different directions, you know, and some of them mm -hmm. are like what Marianne Williamson would say to the prime minister of New Zealand. And some of them are whether Julian Castro <laughs> wants to take away or, or you know, your, your <laughs> AR-15. Like, 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 like that, that was a like very clown memory. show. It was, um, that was a very good spiel, Ben. That was excellent. I completely agree with that. That no, you're right. Like, you're right. You're totally right. Both of you are right. You right. convinced me. There's so like, wait, I gotta, we, we, I gotta ask a, I ask, gotta ask a question to tie all this together with a pretty little bow. So if you were whispering in Biden's ear, um, and you saw that interview last night, what would you advise him about the debate based on what Jonathan Swan pulled off in that Axios interview? What's so the lesson of it? One lesson is that, and this actually played to Biden's strength, is that he doesn't necessarily have to take Trump seriously. Like he can scoff at things that Trump says. You know, I mean, you know, he can, Biden can do the come on man thing that he does on a fairly regular basis. Um, in his stump speech and also occasionally during the 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 uh, the previous debates, because Trump is going to make ludicrous claims that are just clearly not supported by facts. Biden is going to be able to say, "Give me a break. That's not what's happening. Here's what's happening. 
you know, and de- does not have to mix it up with Trump after that. You just have to, to sort of give that peroration and then let Trump shoot himself, basically. Um, so the thing I would say is that, you know, he, he, Biden needs to be prepared for his brief. He needs to be able to, to, and he needs to make sure that the entire debate is about Trump's record. Um, you know, the sort of macro thing of, of, is this about, you know, Trump versus Biden or is it about Trump's record? It should all, you, you know, if you're Biden's campaign, you want this entirely to be about Trump's record because let's face it, his record is abysmal. But the other thing is, is that the other thing you're going to be able to, to do, I suspect, if you're Biden, is that the new line of attack that Trump and others are going to make is that, you know, Joe Biden is a creature of the left or he's, he's like a puppet of, uh, you know, progressives and, and so on and so forth. It is going to be really easy for Biden to give a speech or for Biden to give an answer saying, I'm my own man, you know. I'm not afraid to listen to advice. I'm not afraid to, you know, to hear from people like Bernie Sanders. I'm not afraid to hear from people like Mitt Romney, um, you know, but I'm, I'm going to get all the advice and then I'm going to make my decision. And I'm going to make my decision based on my experience as a politician and my experience as, you know, uh, as, a, as a, someone who served in the Obama administration after we were cleaning up after another Republican administration. So I'm prepared and battle tested and ready for this moment that you have left us due to your complete inept and wanton destruction of the office. I think that's right. I think that's, I think, but, but let me, again, based mostly on your account of the thing, I also think a certain, relent, like the temptation of politicians in the debates is always to seize time and Maybe one of Biden. the Biden doesn't have that instinct be, in no small part because of the story. I mean, Biden was the only one during the Democratic candidates primary debates where, like, he would like he would see that the red light came on and he would right, stop. and he would stop. Yeah. yeah. So, but but maybe the solution, maybe the lesson of the Jonathan Swan thing is that you know you don't see his time. You just you you just say, wait a minute, that's bullshit. Yeah, and basically. and then let him put him on the spot and make him defend it and let him rant more. The other thing to realize is, is that I mean, if you're coaching Biden, is to to remind him you're not Jonathan Swan, you're not a reporter. You know the way the I don't know how the debates are going to be structured, but presumably you're somewhat addressing Trump, but mostly you're going to be addressing the, the moderators, and mostly, frankly, the most important people you're going to be addressing is not Trump, it's not the moderators, it's the it's the audience, it's us, and so you know. Biden can certainly mix it up with Trump, but that shouldn't be the only thing that he does. If I were if I were his staff, you know, what I would say is there's one or two moments where Trump is going to say something about the pandemic or about the economy or most importantly about, you know, racial uh, politics where he is vulnerable. And that's when you can go on the attack. Um, yeah. Because those are the issues where Trump is so far out of step with the rest of the country that Biden can go on the attack and it, it will work. Other than that, Biden stays in his lane, he keeps to his time, he deals with the moderators, he deals with the audience. He lets Trump punch himself. Yeah, it's such, it's like a shame that like Trump in this regard, when he's punching himself, is not more of a Mike Tyson. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just kind of like, it just seems to take a lot of hits. <laughs> like, just... His own ear off. Yes, exactly. <laughs> he his own ear off. <laughs> well, that, that, that's the other thing. Like, you know, so like the other possibility, by the way, of, of things that can that that might happen to Trump that are bad. Don't underestimate a makeup screw up. Like, imagine that, like, you know, he's in a setting where it's not air conditioned because of the coronavirus. It's relatively hot. Like, I mean, did you see him when he was speaking at Mount Rushmore? His hair falls off. Right. Or like, but, but like his, his make like, you know, the spray tan starts to wilt or something. When he gave us the, the speech at uh, Mount Rushmore, he looked like a sausage for Christ's sakes. Cause he was like sweating profusely. So I, I do not underestimate all of that stuff. Like weirdly, it, which is bizarre because Trump more than anyone else cares about these sort of superficial things, but it would not surprise me if he winds up doing something where everyone's like, wait, why is his collar turning like, peach colored. Oh my God, his, you know, his, his tanning stuff is running or something like that. Ben, 
We have to wrap. Kate? No, no. I I think we have to wrap. It's yeah. six o'clock. Um, and Dan, thank you so much for coming on. This was fun. It was a pleasure. As fun and as like sophisticated as I had hoped for. It was exactly oh, what wait. I needed. We did not do a poll. Oh shit. Oh god. Oh my god. Poll. Okay. They're all saying Dan. Well. What do we want to ask? What do we want to ask the audience today? Yeah, people are chanting for you, Dan. Oh, so wait, we need to like a poll. So I have to come up with a poll question. Well, okay. you can we, you can do it in conjunction with us. Let me think. Will there actually be three debates? So right now the. Oh, oh yeah, you know, I say no. I vote well. So right now, like you know, the Commission on Presidential Debates has said there's three how debates. Many deba how many debates will there be? One, two, or three? That's a good one. Yes, that's a good. Yeah, or zero. Put zero. Or zero. Zero is an option. Zero. Because like one, Trump two, is three. calling for like four or more than that, and like that's a good question. Say, yeah. True. You're good at this. It's almost like you're a political scientist or something. <laughs> um, Here we go. Let's take the poll. Oh. Oh, okay. Good good phrasing, Ben. Three fewer more. I like that. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Wow. Fewer than three is winning I am a lot. Actually I am actually voting for no debates. I, I don't get to vote in the formal world, but I don't I've I've never believed there are gonna be debates. Oh, wait. So I'm curious. Why don't you think there'll be debates? Because like at this point, Trump needs the debates. Are you saying Biden would refuse them or? No, I think Biden will insist on the terms list right. specified by the commission and Trump will uh, uh, will ref will refuse the terms of the commission because he wants to blame there being no debates on Biden. They're already setting that up. And I think there will actually not be debates. Um, oh. And um, and uh, it'll be completely irrational. But I think it's actually uh, Trump believes there's advantage in getting Biden to not debate and then blaming him for being a coward. And Biden doesn't need the debates. So no, I Biden think there's not going to be. I, I, the one... The one flaw in that is that I do, I think even Trump recognizes that he's losing and needs the debates. And so I think in the end, this winds up being one of the many, many things that have happened this year where Trump claims this absurd bargaining position, claims he's going to be tough, and then backs down at the final minute and agrees to the debates. That may be right. I'm so still going with, with no debates because it's, uh, it's a position with exactly one vote at 2.4%. And boy, will I look good if it's right. There is one other <laughs> possibility, though, which is if in the first debate Biden stumbles and Trump actually does better than expected, it would not surprise me if Trump then canceled the rest of the debates. Well, then I'd still be right with my vote of fewer than three. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Kate, wrap us up. Uh, we don't have fun anymore. Sorry, I actually do have to think about it every time, like a little bit. We don't have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we have resting anchor face, which is a term <laughs> that Dan has just coined. And I would like everyone to give their impressions of as we sign off tonight. <laughs> what does your anchor resting face look like? 